Welcome back students. In this video segment we will look at two sections, sections 14.3 and 14.4. In 14.3 we look at uh, an introduction to the concept of a partial derivative, a partial derivative of, of a function of, of uh, say two or three or more variables. The, um, the thing is, in order to do this any kind of justice, we need to go back to Calculus 1 and talk about what, what is a, uh, an answer to the question, what is a derivative? What is a derivative? What is a derivative of a function? Um, the, the first thing that should come to mind for you, if somebody asks you what a derivative is, it's, it's the slope of the tangent line to a, to a curve. Or if you want to think early physics example, it, if, uh, if you're given a position function, then the derivative of a position function gives you your, your velocity function. So the derivative of, let's say, s is a function of time t would be your velocity function. So let's, let's use that as a starting point. In order to do that, we're going to need to go really much more into, uh, or much farther back into Calc 1 into that concept. How, do, how did we actually define the derivative of a function. I don't mean, I don't mean uh, how did we find the derivative of a function after we have the definition. We have all kinds of rules for finding derivatives. We have the product rule, quotient rule, chain rule, all kinds of ways to do that. I'm talking about the geometric derivative of, uh, the, of the geometric definition of a derivative. So in order to do that, what we did is we considered a curve uh, at a point A and we assumed that the curve was continuous in a, in a nice little neighborhood of A. And we constructed the best thing we could do using just algebra to estimate the slope of the tangent line. And what, what we did to do that was we took A and increased it by a little bit and then find the and found the slope. Then we found the slope of the line through the point A and a plus h, okay? And what that gave us was something called the slope of the secant line. And the slope of the secant line is nothing more than f of a plus h minus f of a over h. That thing, that quantity that you hopefully spent a lot of time on in pre-calculus called the difference quotient. And if that doesn't make sense, we can we can even do a little bit more here. You see, if we're given two points, a and f of a for the y value, and a plus h, and f of a plus h for the second y value, then we know from algebra that the slope is nothing more than, if you'll recall, the second y value minus the first y value, y2 minus y1, over the second x value minus the first x value. Okay, well the second y value is f of a plus h, so there's y2 minus f of a, uh, that's y1, and x2 minus x1, well a is x1, and a plus h is x2, so x2 minus x1 is a plus h minus a, which is just h. Okay, so that's how we, we kind of got our slope of our secant line. Okay, now again, that was, a, that was our way of getting an estimate to the, to the slope of the tangent line. And in fact, in, in real world applications, that formula the, for the slope, of the slope of the secant line is used to estimate the slope of the tangent line where we can't easily find a derivative just by taking h small enough. And there are error formulas for figuring out how far off you are by doing that. In any case, in Calc 1, what we did was we took the slope of the secant line and then let h get very, very small. We let h get very, very small. If we consider the, the initial point, the point at which we want a tangent to the curve as being, let's say, p, and the point uh, corresponding to a plus h and f of a plus h, we call that q, 
then what we what we did in Calc 1 is we, we allowed Q to slide closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to P. And as that happened, the tangent lines approached closer and closer and closer to the, I'm oh, sorry, the secant lines approached closer and closer and closer to the, to the tangent position. The tangent position, of course, being the, 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 the prize here. And I'll put that prize as a nice thick red line. So as Q slides closer and closer and closer to P, we get the slope of the tangent line. Well, as Q slides closer and closer and closer to P, that H, that H which represents the, the, the run, if you will, in the, in the slope. Remember, the slope is, is rise over run. That H, which represents the run in the slope, approaches zero. So that's how we define the the uh, derivative, the slope of the tangent line is defined as, or rather the, the slope of the tangent line we, we define as the derivative of the function at a and that's simply the limit as h approaches zero of that difference quotient f of a plus h minus f of a over h. If this isn't familiar to you and I'd be very blunt, you're in the wrong class. <laughs> so I'm real, real sure it's familiar to you, even, even if it's, even if it's uh, a little fuzzy. If you haven't seen this, uh, you're definitely in the wrong class, and I think you are all in the right class, so, so I'm confident. Okay, then what we did very soon after that is, is we noticed that the derivative f prime of a also gave us a function uh, but it was evaluated at a, so we simply replaced a with x so that we could have our derivative match up, at least in terms of the variable, with the variable used in our function. So we got the derivative is the limit as h approaches 0, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. This is the definition of the derivative. Well, we need, we need a, a similar concept for uh, surfaces, for functions of two variables and for functions of more, vari more than two variables. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the, the idea, we're going to use the, the, this idea of um, the slope of the tangent line is a, is a limiting value of the slopes of secant lines to construct a similar idea for surfaces, let's say functions of two variables at first, okay? And then soon after that we'll, general, we'll generalize. So let's, let's talk a lot, little bit about geometrically what would, we, what would we mean by the slope of a function of two variables? Okay, let's think about that. So to get the discussion going, here's the surface. Imagine we're in the first octant, I'm going to use this surface this specific drawing a lot for the rest of our for the rest of our semester actually because it's uh it's a, it's a surface that i can draw fairly quickly and, and fairly accurately so i'd like you to visualize this surface get used to it um it's in the first octant and it's shaped like kind of a lime wedge or if you will maybe one eighth of a sphere if you want. So this is a surface in the first octant and I've drawn the point uh, corresponding to a, b, and f of a, b on the surface where the first surface is given by g equals f of x, y. And the idea is what, what do we want to do in terms of defining the uh, a tangent line, the slope of a tangent line to this surface? And, and it, right away the problem the, the the discussion gets complicated because there are an infinite number of um, tangent lines to that to the surface at the point a b and f of a b. There are an infinite number of them. Here's one in red. This particular tangent line may have a particular steepness. Remember, slope gives you the steepness. We also have let's say another one in green. This is also a tan. Oops. This is also a tangent line to the surface. And I missed the point, but that's all right. And let's say here we have another one in purple. Each of these lines, each of these lines that I've drawn has a has a particular steepness and that steep and and that steep steepness would be each of those steepnesses would be a perfectly good candidate for what we might call the slope of a tangent line. Okay, well we want to focus on two very specific 
tangent lines to this surface, two real, real specific tangent lines to this surface. And, and those, those slopes will end up giving us the, the concepts of partial derivatives of the function. So let's return to the surface without those little extra drawings on there, those extra lines on there. And let's, let's, uh, let's talk about isolating some very specific uh, tangent lines to the surface. Okay, um, to, just to make sure that you're all with me, if you imagine, imagine you're standing under an umbrella. Okay, so you're standing in the xy plane, and the surface above you is the umbrella. And imagine on top of the, right, right above your, right above your head on the surface, there's a point on, on the umbrella, and on that point you could have someone place a yardstick or a meter stick. And depending on how they position that yardstick, they could twirl it around and around. You'll get a different, you'll get a different slope. So the, there's the problem with defining a unique slope to a surface is that we can't, we can't. But we can isolate a couple of real important ones. So here we go. Consider, consider the point A corresponding to, to x equals A, y equals B, and z equals f of A, B. What I'm going to do, I want to get rid of, I want to get rid of the, z, the f of A, B. I'm going to need the room. What we're going to do is imagine slicing this surface with a knife. So you can you can envision the surface as being a the the top of a cake or whatever. Okay, in the first octane, we're going to slice through this cake or, or or a loaf of bread or whatever. But we're going to slice through it so that it, so that it cuts through the point of tangency, that one point of tangency, and we're going to slice it with a knife that's parallel to the x z plane. Okay, so I'm going to slice this surface with a plane that's parallel to the XZ plane. I'm trying, I'm, I'm hesitating because I'm trying to decide what kind of color I want to use. And we'll just use black. Okay, so I'm going to form that slice right now. We're going to slice through this surface. We're going to slice through this surface with a knife. I'd like to redraw that. That slice. There we go. That's a little better. We're slicing through with a knife that's parallel, held parallel to the XZ plane. Okay, if I do that, I have a curve. I have a curve on the surface. I want to find the slope of that line. I want to find the slope of that line right there. Okay. So as I notice that as I form that curve, that I'm holding one of the variables in on the curve on the surface, rather, constant. I'm holding the y value constant at b and slicing it so that I have x varying x varying along the curve and z varying along the curve. So I'm going to I'm going to derive this what I'm going to call the slope of that line right now. So I took a chance and I flew up the picture so I could draw a little better on it. And I'm gonna but I'm gonna find the slope of that line, the, 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 the tangent line at that point, that little purple dot, by doing the same thing we do in pre-calc. I'm gonna increase A by a little bit. I'm gonna increase A to A plus H. And I'm gonna go up to the curve at that point and I'm going to draw a line and that line is not the tangent line that line is a secant line so here's that secant line I'm going to draw the secant line through those two points okay so it's not the tangent line it's the secant line I want to find the slope of that line I want to find the slope of that line. Okay, so the slope is rise over run again. There's no change in that. The run is h. The distance from a to a plus h is h. So that's what goes in the denominator. Now, the, the uh, rise is the difference in the z values. It's sort of the z2 minus z1 in this picture. Well, the z2 is f of a plus h 
B, F of A plus H, B, the point, the point in the x-axis, the point in the x-axis, right where I've drawn that little black dot, is A plus H, B. So F of A plus H, that, comma B, that's the Z, that's Z2, if you will. Minus Z1 is F of A, B, A, B in the X, Y plane, this picture. Dividing by the run of H, and that gives me the slope of that secant line, the secant line. Now remember though, we're not after the slope of the secant line. We were after that, and I drew it in a nice thick red before. We were looking for the slope of the tangent line. So I'm going to get that by letting h approach 0, just but like before. So there's really, technically, there's nothing different going on here. We're holding b constant, so that our function is a function of x. So x changes from a to a plus h. So we take f of a plus h, held fixed at b, minus f of a held fixed at b over h, we develop a very similar difference quotient. And that is the slope of the tangent line. That's the slope of the tangent line. The slope of the tangent line is not called the derivative of the function because there's not a unique uh, uh, slope of the tangent line. There's, there's a whole bunch of different lines I could draw. This is a specific one. The symbol for this one is f sub x at the point a b and this is called the partial derivative this is called the partial derivative of the function f with respect to x at the point a comma b Okay. Okay, so that's that's one particular tangent line, one of the one of the two really important tangent lines. I wanted I wanted to find another tangent line. I wanted to find another tangent line and it's going to be very very similar similarly formed. Instead of slicing through the through the the surface holding b constant, if we hold the y value constant, we get the partial derivative with respect to x. I want to hold the x constant at a and slice through the surface and, and try to derive a, tan a different tangent line using exactly the same process. So let's do that. So here's my drawing again. And what I want to do is I want to draw a slice on the through this surface again with a knife held parallel to the yz plane. I hold the knife parallel to the yz plane and slice. I'm going to get something that looks like this. I'm forming that slice as we speak up to the curve and form the slice. The slice has to go through the point. See if I can do this in one, with one shot. Oops. I rarely do this with one, with one drawing. That's all right. I can probably do this all day long, and so I think I'll just accept this one. Okay, so we have a slice through the surface parallel to the to the uh, uh, yz plane. That means we're holding x constant. We're holding x fixed at a. If we hold x fixed at a, then to get the surface, we let y vary. To get, I'm sorry, to get the curve we, the, the, that forms, we get the we let the uh, y vary. Okay, so I want to get rid of my f of a b. So because I kind of need the room in there. I want to define the slope of the line, tangent line to that curve at the point A, B, and Z values F of A, B. So I'm going to do the, the very, very similar thing. as I, In fact, the same thing as I did before, except I'm going to increase B by a little bit. B is going to be increased to B plus H. Then I'm going to find a Z value. Along, this, along that curve on the surface corresponding to a comma b plus h. This is a comma b plus h. 
and the original point is a comma b. So I'm holding a constant. If I do that, I have a secant line formed. Let's see if I can do it. There's not, not too bad. I want to find the slope of that secant line. Not difficult. Not difficult. It's just z2 minus z1 over uh, the, the, the change, the, the rise. Okay, so it, if you're not following with that z2 minus z1, I'll even put z2 and z1 in there. Here's z2, here's z1. Okay, so I'm just using the formula from way back in Algebra 1 to do this very elaborate thing here for Calc 3. So z2 minus z1, well z2 is f of a comma b plus h minus f of a held fixed a, uh, b over the run h. The run, the distance is still, the for the run is h. Okay, then I'm going to let h approach 0, and I'll get another, it's the slope of another tangent line. Okay, I want to take the limit, oops, I want to take the limit of this as h approaches 0, and I get another tangent line. But I don't, get, I don't get the original tangent line I had in red. Let's change the color of that tangent line. I'm going to get that tangent line now. I'll use blue. I'm going to get this one. Okay. The slope of that tangent line I get by, by holding A fixed and let the Y values vary to form that curve. And that symbolically results in F sub Y at AB. And that's called the partial derivative. Partial derivative of F with respect to Y. Oops, with respect to Y. That means I'm holding X constant, and letting Y vary with respect to Y at the point A, B. Okay, and these, these, uh, these quantities are what hold together a whole bunch of calculus, a whole bunch of calculus, okay? I wanna see both of these, I wanna see both of these quantities in one drawing and talk about them a little bit, a bit more before we start computing them. So here are, here are both slices, the slice held parallel to the xz plane is in purple. The second slice parallel to the yz plane is in green. For the purple curve that's formed, the slope of the resulting tangent line is called the partial derivative of f with respect to x at a, b. And we get it by holding b constant and letting x vary to form the the, uh, the curve and then ultimately the slope of the tangent line to that curve. Okay, so this is the partial uh, with respect to x. So I'm, it means partial derivative, but very common, commonly we just say partial. It means partial derivative with respect to x. To x. That means we hold y constant. The slope of the other line, f sub y at a, b, the slope of the other line we get by holding x constant. We hold, hold x constant and we get the partial derivative or very commonly we just say the partial with respect, oops, <laughs> with respect to y. When you take a partial derivative with respect to y, you hold x constant. And that gives us two, the slopes of two tangent lines to the surface. Um, and, uh, again, there are an infinite number of them, but these two, it, it turns out these two slopes can be used to determine the slopes of any of the other tangent lines to the surface. Okay, we'll see that in, in section Oh, 14.6, I believe, when we talk about the directional derivative. Okay. Okay. Just as before, we can replace the, the uh, variables A, or the constants A and B for the fixed point AB with X and Y. 
So we can form f sub x of x, y, and that's the partial derivative of f with respect to x. And we have a new symbol, an additional symbol for that. And I'm sure you've seen it. You open almost any advanced math book uh, for the sciences and you see this symbol. It looks like the the, the symbols that we used for the, the alternate symbols we used for the derivative. Remember, uh, for, for in Calc 1, you could write f prime of y, or you could write dy over dx. Well, we have, if you take the d's and change them into curly d's or, or more lyrical d's, in fact, they're, they're very often they're called lyrical d's because they sort of look poetic. See that D the way I formed it? Looks like looks sort sort of like a backward six. It's a it's a symbol that was um um I I believe it was uh, first used by a mathematician named Jacoby, and it's used to to differentiate no pun intended to differentiate between a partial derivative and the ordinary derivative that that we look at in Calc 1. So we write it as that sort of backward six looking D or the lyrical D of F with respect to so partial symbol X or we can write partial Z with respect to X and notice what I just said as I wrote this the symbol and Z I, th I actually said partial z over partial x. It's extremely common to use that, that terminology. So partial z over partial x means the partial derivative of z with respect to x, and we use that sort of backward six looking notation. Okay, very, very common notation. Similarly, the partial derivative of the function with respect to y, we get by holding x constant, is the partial f partial y or partial z partial y. Okay, so we're going to do what we're going to do now, now that we have a, an interpretation, really, really kind of basic interpretation of what these symbols mean geometrically um, and we'll return to, to those to that to, to more um, uh, interpretations geometrically of these symbols we want to know how to compute these things we want to compute the partial derivatives just like we needed formulas for computing or a way to compute der ordinary derivatives from calc 1 besides using these limit definitions um, in this course I don't emphasize the limit definition of the of the partial derivative very much at all. There are going to be a, a couple of places in the course where you need to refer to them, but for the most part, we're going to use nice formulas. So let's let's develop formulas for finding partial derivatives. Okay. So we go back to Calc one first. Okay, Calc one d dx means the part the ordinary derivative, regular old derivative. So the derivative of 3x squared, we know is 6x, but it's really 3 times the derivative with respect to x of x squared. Okay, remember, constants can be factored out of the differentiation symbol, and this is just 3 times 2x or 6x. We hardly ever think about it that way. We just imagine bringing the 2 down as an exponent and, and multiplying by 3. But this is technically what's happening. So if I have something like d dx of 4x squared, and I know you know how to do this. I'm, I'm just trying to develop a point with you that, that uh, assume about uh, finding derivatives, partial derivatives. So we get 8x here. Okay. So if I had something like the derivative with respect to x of ax squared, where a is constant, then the a can come out of the, it doesn't matter what the constant is, a can, the constants can come out of the differentiation symbol or operation, and we get 2ax. Okay, so what about if I replace that a with y? What's the derivative of, what the ordinary derivative with respect to x of 
why x squared? Well, there's no such thing. <laughs> unless, there's no such thing unless uh, y is a function of x. Y is some function of x. Then we have something called implicit differentiation, and we can, we can go forward with this. But in this course, uh, we're not assuming necessarily that the, the two variables x and y in the function f of x, y, that there's any relationship between them. They're independent of each other. They're independent variables. So how do I take the derivative of the function y, x squared? How do, well, first of all, if it's going to be with respect to x, it needs to be a partial derivative because it's a function of more than one variable. And it's simple. It's simple. If you can understand, if you can understand the ordinary derivative that I did up here of ax squared, remember a was a constant, then the partial derivative of yx squared with respect to x is no different. Now think about, think back to with me on what it means to take the derivative, partial derivative with respect to x. The partial derivative with respect to x we got, oops, that's the wrong one. Partial derivative with respect to x we got by slicing with a knife held fi fixed at y equals b. y was held constant at b. y is held constant. y is held constant. If y is held constant, then this is nothing more than y times the derivative, partial derivative with respect to x of x squared, or y times 2x, or 2xy. So here's the, here's the bottom line. If you want to find a partial derivative with respect to x of a function, algebraically you do that by holding every other independent variable fixed. Remember, in a function f of x, y, the independent variables are x and y. So when you're taking a partial derivative with respect to x, you hold every other independent variable. Well, in a function of two variables, there's only one other independent variable. You hold it constant. If it's constant, you can, you can factor it out of the differentiation process. Okay? So if, if you're okay with that, then you should be also you should also be okay with the with maybe taking the partial derivative of the function y x squared with respect to y. If you're taking a derivative with respect to y, that means you're holding x constant. So x is constant, so x squared is constant. And that can be factored out of the differentiation process. And what's the derivative of y with respect to y? It's 1. OK. So we can take partial derivatives with respect to x. And we do that by holding every other variable, independent variable, constant. And so we hold, when we take partial derivative with respect of x of a function of two variables, we hold y constant. If we take a partial derivative with respect to y, we hold x constant, OK? So let's practice a little bit. So for example, let's find, let's say, the partial derivative of z with respect to x and the partial derivative of z with respect to y, a. I'm just making this function up as I go along. Keep it simple though, 3x cubed y squared plus 4xy cubed plus 7x plus 8y plus 15. So z is a function of x and y. Suppose I want the partial derivative of z with respect to x. So in taking the partial derivative of z with respect to x, I'm pretending that y is constant. I'm not pretending y is constant. I'm holding y constant. So what's constant is 3 in the first term and y squared. 
So the only term or the only factor in three x cubed y squared that's 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 not constant is x cubed. What's the derivative of x cubed? It's three x squared. Yeah, the, the constants just follow along. Okay, so now the next term. I'm taking the derivative of four x y cubed with respect to x. Four is constant, y cubed is constant. What's the derivative of x? It's one. Or you could think about it, what's the derivative of four x? It's four. So this, oops, I want to go back to black here. So this is plus four y cubed. What's the derivative of seven x with respect to x? Of course it's seven. Now here's the make or break question for you right now. Don't worry if you don't get it, but I think you will. What's the derivative of eight y with respect to x? It's zero. Why? Because I'm holding y constant. If y is constant, eight times y is constant. And the derivative of a constant is zero. Of course, the derivative of 15 with respect to x or y is zero. So here's our derivative with respect to x. So let's do this with respect to y now. Let's find the partial derivative of z with respect to y. Okay, let me get rid of my little red arrows. Ooh, I went with an eraser. <laughs> Okay, now we're going to take a derivative of this function with respect to y, so we're going to hold x constant. So, with respect to y, x is constant. So, 9x squared is constant. <laughs> Anything that doesn't have a y in it is constant. When I'm taking a derivative with respect to y, what's the derivative of y squared? It's 2y. And 2y times 9x squared is 18x squared. So 18x squared times y. So what's the derivative of 4y cubed? Oh, you know what? I'm taking the derivative of the wrong function. Sorry, I'm taking the derivative of the derivative. We're going to do that later. <laughs> I'm sorry. My bad, my bad. Okay. All right. All right. Not this is an easy fix here, so we're going back to our original function here. Sorry. So back up, partial derivative with respect to y, holding x constant. So x is constant. X is constant. So is uh, x uh, x cubed three times x cubed is constant. Constant. Derivative of y squared is two y. So I'm going to fix my derivative here. So the derivative of y squared is 2y, so I'm going to get 6x cubed y squared. I feel so bad for making that mistake. Where you, it's very, you're just learning this stuff, and well, I'll try to be more careful. Next term, 4xy cubed with respect to y. Well, if I differentiate with respect to y, I'm holding anything with an x in it constant. 4 and x are both constant. So 4x is constant. The derivative of y cubed is 3y squared. y squared. Fixing that cubed here. Okay. What's the derivative of 7x with respect to y? It's zero. If, if x is held constant, 7 times x is going to be constant. And derivative of a constant is, 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 uh, is 0. Remember, we're differentiating with respect to y. What's the derivative of 8y with respect to y? Oh my goodness, yes, that's easy. It's 8. Okay. B. B. Let's see. Suppose we have... Let me get some trig functions involved here. So x times cosine of y plus tangent of y. That'll work. I want to make it more. Why not? Plus sine of xy. There we go. So let's take the partial derivative of z with respect to x. So what's the derivative with respect to x of x times cosine y? Well, if, if, if uh, x if, if I'm taking a derivative with respect to x, that means anything with a y in it, any function with y is constant. What's the derivative of x? It's 1. So this is just cosine of y. It would be like taking the derivative of 7, uh, 7x. It would be 7. 
because 7 is constant. Well, the derivative of cosine y times x is cosine y. Okay, what's the derivative with respect to x of tangent y? It's not secant squared y. It's 0 because when I take a derivative with respect to x, I'm holding y constant. If y is constant, the tangent of y is constant, and the derivative of a constant is 0. So here, I put that little extra sign of xy in there. I want to take the derivative with respect to x of sine of xy. What would be the derivative, just off to the side here, what would be the derivative with respect to x of sine of 7x? Oops, it doesn't look like an x. 7x still doesn't look like an x, but I'll leave it. <laughs> the derivative of sine of 7x with respect to x would be cosine of 7x times 7, the derivative of the inside with respect to x. So let's use that as a guide for the derivative of sine of xy. So y is constant, it's constant, just like the, the 7 was held. It was not held constant, it is constant. So the derivative, the easy part, the easy part is the derivative of sine is cosine, so it's going to be cosine of xy times the derivative of the inside function with respect to x. With respect to x holds y constant. If it was 7x, it would be 7. So if it's yx, it'll be y. You might have to stop, stop the video and look at that one or retry it on your own. There's no problem with that. You stop it at any time. Now let's take the derivative with respect to y. If I take the derivative with respect to y, and I'll do the original function this time correctly. So the derivative with respect to y of cosine of y is negative sine of y. x is held constant. So if it's x, or if it's 7, or if it's pi over 4 as it, it, cosine y, the x is constant. So we can take the derivative of cosine, we get negative sine of, of uh, y times the original constant x. What's the derivative with respect to y of tangent y? That one's secant squared y. Okay, so now what's the derivative with respect to y of sine of xy? Well, in this case, with, when I take the derivative with respect to y, the x is constant. It's the y that's variable with respect to y. So what's the derivative of sine? The easy part is cosine. So it's cosine of xy times the derivative of xy with respect to y. y is variable. So the derivative of xy, derivative of 3y would be 3. The derivative of xy would be x with respect to y. Okay. That x doesn't look like an x there. A little better. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna do maybe one more. This one's tricky. It's a simple looking function, but it's tricky. It's tricky. So um let's see what I'm gonna do here. Well I'll keep it not so not too tricky. Try to un untricky it. <laughs> Okay, y times e to the xy. I want the partial derivative with respect to x. Or you could use the subscript notation, cx, either way. So partial derivative of, with respect to x. Now let me ask you, it's a product of two functions, y and e to the xy. Do I use the product rule here? Do I use, when I'm taking the derivative of this with respect to x, do I use the product rule here? Well, would I use the product rule if I had 3e to the 3x? No, no. I'm holding y constant, so there's no need to use the product rule on this. So the derivative of y e to the xy is, y is held constant, so it just follows along. The derivative of e to anything is that same thing back, e to that anything, times the derivative, the chain rule, the derivative with respect to x of xy. What's the derivative with respect to x of, with respect to x of xy? Y is held constant, so it's just y. So this is y squared e to the xy. So let's do partial derivative of z with respect to y. So partial z 
partial y. So let me ask you that original question I asked when I started this problem. Do I use the product rule? Do I use the product rule on this? Well, what's the live the, the, the live variable? What's a variable here? Would I use would I use the product rule in y e to the five y? Yes, because y this is the product of two functions of y. So would I use would I use the product rule for y e to the x y? Yes, x is held constant. So with respect to y, x is held constant. So that so I have a product of two functions of y. So the, the product rule, so that's why it makes this a little tricky. The derivative of the first, derivative of y with respect to y is 1 times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. So what's the derivative of e to the xy, the second function, with respect to y? Well, derivative of e to anything is, the, is that thing back again. Now, Take the, by the chain rule, I need to take the derivative of xy with respect to y. That's just x. So I'm going to get e to the xy plus xy e to the xy. Doesn't look like e to the xy there, does it? So e to the xy. I mean, that's fine, or you could maybe factor out the e to the xy. The original one just before the last line there is, is just fine. Okay. Let's see here. Let's talk about implicit differentiation. Implicit differentiation. So you notice what we're doing here. It looks like we're doing the same thing as we did in Calc 1. It's just we're introducing partial derivatives. And it's exactly what's going on. Exactly what's going on. I want to remind you about implicit differentiation uh, from with an example from Calc 1. So here's an example from Calc 1. Suppose we have x cos xy plus cosine y. Uh, well, we don't have to do that. Let's say, make it even simpler. Let's just say xy equals cosine xy. Yeah, why not? That'll work. Okay, and I want, I'm assuming that y is a function of x. So the directions here are to find y prime. So this is a calc 1 example, just to get us ready for the new stuff. Calculus 1 example. Okay, so let's make a little row in here. Okay, that'll work. All right. So how did we do that? What we did is we imagined taking the derivative with respect to x of both sides. This is not a partial derivative problem here. This is an ordinary derivative problem. This is back in Calc 1. Um, x and y are not independent variables. X and y are, are uh, y is, uh, x is the independent variable. I'm assuming that y is a function of x, that this theoretically could be solved for y. Not real easily, but, and not using finite combinations of elementary functions, but theoretically I could solve for y, so I could find y prime. Remember, implicit differentiation allowed us to do that, to find the derivative without solving for y. Very powerful, powerful idea. Okay, so let's take the derivative on the left. On the left we have two functions of x, so we do use the product rule. Derivative of x is 1 times y plus x times the derivative of y. What's the derivative of y? It's y prime. Okay. Or, which is just fine, by the way. I'm going to go ahead and use uh, times dy dx, the symbol. So what's the derivative with respect to x of cosine of y? Well, the derivative of cosine is negative sine by the chain rule times the derivative of the inside times dy dx. And that way you had to do was to solve for y prime. So I'll do that real quick. So this is x, d, I'm going to get the y primes on one side, the, the dy dx is on one side, plus sine of y times dy dx equals negative y 
I'll factor out the dy dx uh, equals minus y. Divide both sides by x plus sine of y. So dy dx equals minus y over x plus sine of y. Okay, this is old news to us. Really, really, really old news. So now, now, new stuff. So calc 3 example, calc 3 example. Find, uh, let's say, the partial derivative of z with respect to x if, let's say, x, y, z equals the cosine of x plus y plus z. Okay. Now, the assumption here, the assumption here is that z is some theoretical function of two independent variables x and y. That's the assumption here. Just like the assumption up above was that y is some function of x buried in that equation. So I'm assuming that that equation, x, x times y times z, can be solved theoretically for, um, for z as a function of x and y. So the idea with implicit differentiation is exactly the same. I'm going to find the derivative with respect to x. I could also do with respect to y. I'm just doing one. Partial derivative with respect to x of x, y, z equals the partial derivative with respect to x of cosine of x plus y plus z. And then go forward. Now, here's the tricky part. I'm assuming, I'm assuming that z is a function of x and y. Okay, so the variables, there are, there are three variables here. There's x is an independent variable, y is an independent variable, and z is a dependent variable. It depends on x and y. So when I take a derivative with respect to x, what am I holding constant? I'm holding constant, the, not z, because z is a function of x and y. I'm holding every other independent variable fixed. So y is constant, so I can factor that y, and that's all that I can factor out of the derivative with respect to x. Okay, if, if you're still not with me on that, that's, this, that's a variable x, and so is z, I'm assuming, a function of x and y. So z also is a function of x. Okay, so the y can factor out, and I'm going to take the derivative of the, of the right-hand side, the derivative of cosine, this negative sine, of whatever we're taking the original cosine of times the derivative of the inside function with respect to x. So what's the derivative of x with respect to x? It's 1. What's the derivative of y with respect to x? It's 0. What's the derivative of z with respect to x? It's partial z, partial x. Okay. Let's continue on on the left-hand side. We're going to get y. And I'm going to need the, the product rule here. I have the product of two functions, x and z. So the derivative of the first of x is 1 with respect to x times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second equals negative sine of x plus y plus z times 1 plus partial z partial x. Okay, now there's a bunch of work to do, but the, the calculus is done. Now it's just algebra. We're going to distribute the y on the left-hand side, so we're going to have y, z, plus x, y, partial z, partial x, equals, I'm going to distribute the negative sign of x plus y plus z into the 1 plus partial z, partial x. So I'm going to distribute times 1 
minus sine of x plus y plus z times partial z partial x. Okay, and the prize, keep your eye on the prize. The prize is partial z partial x. So I'm going to get partial z partial x on one side and everything that has to do with it on one side. So I have xy partial z partial x already on the left, and I'm going to add the sine of x plus y plus z times partial z partial x. And the only thing left on the right hand side for the, for the time being is negative sine of x plus y plus z. But I'm also going to subtract the y times z from both sides because the y times z doesn't have a partial on it. So I'm going to subtract yz, almost there. I'm going to factor out a partial z partial x. x plus y plus z. OK, so on the left-hand side, that's all I did. On the right-hand side, I'm doing nothing. You can factor out a negative one if you wanted to, but it's really not necessary plus y plus z minus yz. Then divide both sides by xy times sine of x plus y plus z. So the uh, concepts that we learned in Calc 1 follow us. Of course they do. Partial derivatives are just derivatives. They're just derivatives. We're just holding some variable, we're taking derivative with respect to one independent variable there and holding the rest constant. All the rules, product rule, quotient rule, chain rule, all of those rules we learned still follow. Okay. Okay, so moving right along here. So I mentioned that you can have functions of many independent variables. So I should try an example with, with uh, let's say, a function of three variables. The concept is exactly the same. If I have a function f of x, y, and z, then there are three partial derivatives possible. I can take the partial derivative of f with respect to x. And what is that? Partial derivative of f with respect to x. That means I hold y and z constant. So what's the partial derivative of f with respect to y? That means I hold x and z constant. x is constant. So x squared is constant. So that x squared is just going to follow. What's the derivative of e to the yz with respect to y? It's e to the yz. And here's the tricky part. What's the derivative of yz with respect to y holding z constant? It's z. C e to the y z. So let's take the derivative of f with respect to z. That means we hold x and y constant. So x is constant, so it just follows along. What's the derivative of e to the y z with respect to z? It's e to the y z. What's the derivative of y z with respect to z? That means we hold y constant times y, so it's x squared y e to the y z. I just thought I'd introduce a function of more than one variable just to just so you see that, that uh, this can this can extend. Okay. Now, remember in Calc one, we started out with y. Then we found y prime or dy dx, but y prime was also a function of x. So we could take another derivative. And we could use the denotation to get d squared y over dx squared. And we can continue going with y, y triple prime, y fourth prime, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. OK. What about functions of more than one variable? If z equals f of x y, I can take a derivative of, let's do it like this, 
Um, yeah, I could take a derivative of z with respect to x. Okay. Um, I'm going to use the f notation. Yeah. Sorry about that, I just changed my mind with notation, so f sub x, it's okay. okay. But I could also take the derivative with respect to x again. I could take a derivative with respect to x of both sides. I could take the derivative with respect to x of the left-hand side. And I could take the derivative with respect to x of the right-hand side. On the left, I have fx and then x again. On the right-hand side, I have partial squared f over partial x squared. Same thing, same thing with respect to y. I have f of f sub y, the derivative with respect to y is partial f partial y. I can take another derivative with respect to y of both sides of this. Partial, partial y, partial f, partial y. So I get partial, second partial derivative with respect to y. Fyy equals the second par partial squared f over partial y squared. Okay. Okay. So let's um let's take a look at that as an example. Then we'll I'll blow your mind with a different kind of with an additional partial derivative. So let's say let z equal eight x cubed y minus x cosine y. Okay, so let's find zx. Okay, or partial z partial x using both notations here. So we hold y constant. So 8x cubed times the derivative of y is 1. And the derivative with respect to x of x cosine y. Cosine y is constant because y is constant. So the derivative of x is 1. So I get minus cosine y. So zxx, the second partial derivative with respect to x. Partial squared z partial x squared. Well, derivative of 8, 8x cubed is 24x squared. What's the derivative of cosine y with respect to x? It's 0. Zero. Okay. Now let's do this again. With, let's do this again, with, but with uh, with y. So here we go. Partial of z with respect to y, or partial notation, partial z, partial y equals. I'm looking back and I think I made a mistake with partial z partial x. Ah, crud. I'm sure you saw it. Mm. Did you see it? Hmm. It's an easy fix. I just wish I didn't make the mistake. So it's right here. So let's uh, back up a little bit. And I think our second partial with respect to x is going to be wrong too. Okay, so let's let's do look at this again. The partial derivative of z with respect to x holds y constant. So y is held constant, constant. So the derivative of 8x cubed with respect to x is 24x squared. So, uh, Professor Leon, clean this up. So this is 24 x squared y. Okay, my apologies. Is the second one okay? The second, second, second term is okay. Derivative of x is 1 with respect to x. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So now let's, uh, let's get a nice fresh new <laughs> derivative with respect, second derivative with respect to x. This doesn't help when your students are trying to learn this for the first time, Leon. All right, so derivative z with respect to x. So now let's take a second derivative with respect to x. And I'll try to do it right this time. Holding y constant, the derivative of 24x squared is 48x. y is constant. What's the derivative with respect to y of cosine y? It's 0, so at least I got that right. So let's do the derivative with respect to y. 
That means we're going to hold x constant. So if we hold x constant in 8x cubed y, if we hold x constant in 8x cubed y, then 8x cubed is constant. The derivative of y is 1. Yeah, so my first attempt at this, I was really doing the partial with respect to y at first. Okay, enough babbling here. 8x cubed. Now the derivative with respect to y of eight of x cosine y, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so this is positive x sine y. I'm just not convinced of this. No, this is okay. I'm just paranoid now. <laughs> I'm also double checking. It's okay now. Okay. So let's take the second derivative, partial derivative with respect to y. So that's partial squared z over partial y squared. And then what's the derivative of 8x cubed with respect to y? It's zero. And what's the derivative of x sine y with respect to y? It's x cosine y. Okay. Now, that's the similarity. Those are the similar derivatives we have to the first, to the first and second derivatives in Calc 1, f prime and f double prime. But we have something unique to this, to this, to this uh, course that we don't didn't have in Calc 1. You see, z sub x, partial z partial x, that's also a function of y of x and y. The derivative of a function of x is in general another function of x. Another function of x. So a deriv derivative of a function of x and y is just another function of x and y. So we could take another derivative with respect to x. But we could also take the derivative of z sub x with respect to what? <laughs> with respect to y. And that's the new stuff. That's the new thing here. We could take the derivative of both sides of this equation with respect to y. Even though it, it was a, first of all, it was a derivative with respect to x. Let's just do it. The derivative of, of 24x squared y with respect to y, means we hold x constant, is 24x squared. What's the derivative of cosine of y with respect to y? It's negative sine of y. Okay. Um, let's also note <laughs> that with our partial derivative with respect to y, we could also take a derivative of it with respect to x. So remember, z sub y, z sub y was 8x cubed, if I did it right, <laughs> plus x sine y. So I could take derivative again, like I did before. I went zy and then with respect to y again. I could also take the derivative of it with respect to the other independent variable. So I could take the derivative with respect to x of z sub y, or the derivative with respect to x using the partial notation, partial z, partial y. And what would that be? The derivative of 8x cubed is 8 times 3, 24x squared. The derivative of x sine y with respect to x is, what's the derivative of x with respect to x? It's 1. Okay. Now, that gives us something. These two last examples give us something new. They are called mixed partial derivatives. Okay, so with mixed partial derivatives, we get some 
some new notation as well that we that's not familiar to us from Calc 1. I'm going to put that, that new notation in a nice red here. Okay, so notice here the partial with respect to y of zx can be written as it was first with respect to x and then with respect to y. So the subscript notation zxy means the partial first with respect to x and then with respect to y. But look what happens when we use the, the, the lyrical d or the partial notation. We get partial squared z and we get partial, partial y, partial x if we read from right to left. The order with the variables appear is different in the partial notation as a subscript notation. Okay, that really needs to be talked about. I'm just recopying what I just wrote. Oops. Partial y, partial x, okay. So with the subscript notation, what you see is what you get. Z sub xy means first with respect to x, then with respect to y. But if you use the partial notation, you have to read the, the denominators backwards. Okay. So second was with respect to y. So zxy means first with respect to x, then with respect to y. But partial squared z over partial y partial x, you read it backwards. It's partial squared z over partial x read first, then with respect to y partial y. Okay. Also, if I go go to our partials with respect to z above, uh, with respect to x above, we have zyx is the partial derivative, second partial, first with respect to y, then with respect to x. So we have to do that reversed, reversed, uh, rather reversed. We have to reverse the, the way we read it in the denominators. Now, what is what else is something to notice about these mixed partials? What else is something we note about the mixed partials? The first one was zxy. The second one was zyx. They're equal, always, for us. <laughs> and with the kinds of functions that we're going to see in our course, mixed partial derivatives are always equal. Always, 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 always. For our functions. If you're a math major, you'll discover when you take a course in multivariable calculus in, in your third and fourth year, uh, you'll discover the conditions under which we get this, this these mixed partial derivatives equal. Mixed partials are equal. Mixed partials are equal. And it doesn't matter how many mixed par how many par partial derivatives you take. Z x x y x y is the same thing as z x x y y is the same thing as z, y, y, x, x. If you take, ooh, we need three x's. Uh, if you take mixed partials, the order in which you do any partial, the, any of the partials is not, is not important. You get the same thing, no matter what, no matter what. Okay. Okay. So how would we write z, x, x, y, x, y, using the partial notation. What's the order of derivative? It's which derivative? I'm just making this up as I go along. Well, not, I'm not making up the, the rules. I've made up the problem. I'm making up the rules as I go along. That would not be good. One, two, three, four. This is the fifth derivative of z. First with respect to x. Then with respect to x again then with respect to y, then with respect to x, then with respect to y. Notice I'm forming this backwards. Okay, so remember you gotta go backwards. So first, we take those two partials. Next, we take that partial. 
Next, we take that partial, and finally, we take a partial derivative with respect to y. Okay. Okay, so let's get away with it the, from these uh, uh, formulas and stuff, and let's think about geometrically. Geometrically, what do we get? What are we getting here? So, um, if we have y, it, calc 1. Calc 1, y. What does that give you? Gives you a location, a point. What does y prime give you? Give you a slope. What does y double prime give you? It measures concave up, concave down, and for, and for us earlier in the course, it helped us measure curvature. Okay. So what about calc 3? Calc 3. What does z give us? It gives us location. Point on the curve. It gives a point on the curve. What does z sub x give us? Slope in x direction. That means we held y constant, slope in the x direction. z sub y is slope in the y direction. What is zxx? It's concavity in the x direction. Zyy is concavity in the y direction. Concavity in the y direction. So let's think about that with our one of our original drawings with the um, surface and the different tangent lines. Let's think about what these quantities mean geometrically. Okay, so zx, zx equals the slope of that tangent line, the slope with respect to x, slope in the x direction, in the x direction holding y constant. And zxx is the concavity of that purple uh, measures the concavity, what the concave up or concave down of that con of that purple cross section in the x direction. So this is measures concavity. So can you tell me what zxx would be for this particular function? Would it be positive or would it be negative? Okay, for us, for this curve would be negative. It's the purple curve's concave down. Okay. Similarly, z sub y equals the slope in the y direction. Slope of the green curve. It could be that green curve could be placed in the x y. I'm sorry, in the y z plane. If I translated it back, what's well, the slope in the y direction? So, z y y measures concavity in that direction. Concavity in the y direction, and that should be less than zero for our particular function. So I want to do an example, and this is going to be good for you. If you can't get it, don't worry about it. Just make sure that you study the example. Name a surface. Name. Doesn't look like the word name, does it? Example. Name a surface. Or come up with a formula for the surface where zx at the origin is zero, zy at the origin is zero, zxx at the origin is less than zero, and zyy y at the origin is greater than zero. Okay, and you can even have one more thing. Z of zero, zero equals zero. 
So it goes through the origin in three space. It goes through the origin in three space. And we have the, the slope in the x direction is zero. The slope in the y direction is zero. The concavity in the x direction is negative. It's concave down, sorry. It, it is in, in the, in the um, x direction, concave down and, and, oh, sorry, concave up in the y direction. Concave down, x direction, concave, y, uh, sorry, up in the y direction. What kind of surface will do this? Let's see if I can, uh, see if I can, <laughs> I'm just seeing if I can do something more basic, like drawing a set of axes. Okay, here. So here's, here's three space. So the, the surface goes through the origin. Z of zero, zero equals zero. Check. Check that off. Okay. The derivative, the slope in the x direction is zero and the slope in the y direction is zero maybe let's let's uh skip to the concavity the concavity z x x is at the origin is less than zero so the concavity in the x direction concavity in the x direction this is supposed to be in the in the x c plane is is uh, negative okay so this is in the xc plane but the concavity in the y direction is positive let's do that with green concavity in the y direction is positive okay so this is in the y direction the green direction the red direction is in the x direction and the slopes are zero, can you name a surface that has that true? If you didn't think about it, I'm going to slowly draw it and shout it out when you get it, unless you're going to wake someone up. I'm going to continue drawing the surface. <laughs> Got it yet? No? I don't think you need much more. Probably brings back on memories <laughs> it is a hyperbolic paraboloid okay this is the one we started with in in section 12.6 the, the 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 hyperbolic paraboloid we started with it was z equals y squared minus x squared let's see if it works out zx negative 2x partial z partial y is 2y Second partial with respect to x is negative 2. That's less than 0. Second partial with respect to y is positive 2. It's greater than 0. And of course, z of 0, 0 equals 0 squared minus 0 squared equals 0 goes through the origin. z sub x of 0, 0 equals 0. It's horizontal tangent in the x direction. Z sub y is 0, 0 equals 0. Horizontal tangent in the y direction is 0. So we have everything we need. It goes through the origin. Slope in the x direction is 0. Slope in the y direction is 0. Concavity in the x direction is negative. Concavity in the direction is positive. A curve that satisfies that is z equals x squared, y squared minus x squared hyperbolic paraboloid. Okay. Well, I went that, through that example quickly, but... Um, Stop the video and take a look at it more carefully if you want. Okay, that well, that ends section. That ends most of our work, by the way. Then section fourteen point three, fourteen point four is a long section in your textbook, but there's only one thing I want you to get out of it. I would like you to get out of section fourteen point four one thing. Now, if you want to take a break, I I would suggest it. Uh, I'm going to take a break, and I'll be back. Uh, in reality, probably about 10 minutes, but for you, about 10 seconds. <laughs> so if you want to take a break, that would be great. Okay, so in 14.4, the title of the section is Tangent Planes and Linear Approximations. I'm interested in, for you guys, I'm only interested in the tangent plane. The first 
of the two fundamental problems in calculus. There are only two fun fundamental problems in Calc in Calc 1. The first one is find the tangent line. The second one is find the area. The first of the of the problems in Calc 1, in Calc, oops, I don't want to go to red, in Calc 1, was given a point on a function, find, find the equation of a tangent line. Find an equation of the tangent line. Line to, let's say, y equals f of x at x equals a. Okay. And you did a whole bunch of math. You did about you studied limits for about a month, so you could get this derivative, and then come up with this uh, this uh, tangent line goes through the point a f of a. So this is again this is from calc one. So the tangent line was y minus f of a. It's just using the point slope form of the line y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 uh, equals the slope, which is what that month was spent on the, with limits and stuff, times x minus x, uh, times x minus a. Okay, now we would like the uh, a, a uh, similar thing if possible to the slope of a, or not to the slope of a, but uh, to the tangent line in, in Calc 1. Now remember though, um, we don't get a, tangent, a single tangent line to a surface. We have an infinite number of them. Remember the umbrella idea, and right above your head there's a point on the surface, and you, if you put a yardstick on top the the a point on the surface of the umbrella, you have an infinite number of, of tangent lines. Well, what do, what do you get when you get all of the tangent lines at that point? When, what, if, what do you get when you take the yardstick on the, that, that touches one point on the umbrella on the surface and twirl it around and around and around and around? What are you generating? You're generating a tangent plane. So while a surface has many, many infinitely many tangent lines at a point, Generally, there will be only how many tangent planes? One. One. So, what I'd like to do is consider finding the equation of the tangent plane to the, to the uh, uh, surface. Well, what, did, what is required for, the, for a line, for the tangent line? What's required for the line is a point, A, F of A, and what else? A slope, f prime at a. Okay, so what's required for a tangent plane? A point, just like, like with the tangent line, but what else? Not a slope, because there are an infinite number of slopes, but there's only what one of what kind of direction? A normal direction. There's only one normal. Okay, so we need a normal direction to the tangent plane, and that's what I'm gonna that's what I'm gonna derive for you. Your author does it; he does it in a very different way than I do. I don't like the way he does it, but um, that's just my opinion. You can read his way if you want. I want to derive the the a normal direction for the tangent plane for you. Okay, so here's that same picture as before of our surface and the two tangent lines that we had pictured before to get the partial with respect to x and the partial with respect to y. Now I'm going to draw the tangent line, the, the tangent plane in there now. Here's the tangent plane. Here's the tangent plane. I'm just taking our original drawing and drawing in now a tangent plane. And of course it's going to contain those, those two lines. Okay, so here's our tangent plane. And are both those lines. Here's our tangent plane. Let me, um, that last little line that I drew in there. Let's see. Let's do this. I'll draw a little more. 
artistically correct. Very little artistically correct. <laughs> okay, it's okay. All right, so here's that's about the best I can do for now. All right, all right. So to to find an equation of a plane, I need two things. I need a point. This is a the tangent plane now. Tangent plane. I need two things. I need a point and a normal. I'm going to call the point just to be consistent with our textbook x naught, y naught, z naught. Okay, there's x naught. We used to call it a. There's y naught. That's what we called b before. Okay. I need a normal. I need a normal. If I can get that normal, then it's over. I need a normal direction. I need a normal. So let me let me draw a nice thick red normal vector. There we are. This is what we need. Okay. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create that normal by crossing two vectors. I'm gonna cross two vectors. One of those vectors is going to be in the plane of the purple curve. When I hold Y constant, it's going to be in the plane of the purple curve. It's going to be a vector along the tangent line. It's going to be a vector. Let me see if I do this in a different color here. It's going to be a green vector. This little green vector right here along the tangent line in the X direction. Okay. I'm also going to take a blue vector and on the tangent line in the Y direction and I'm going to find that vector. And what do you think I'm going to do with those vectors to get that normal? By now that should be, oh, that should be pretty automatic. <laughs> I got to cross them. I'm going to cross them. Okay. So I'm going to need something. I'm going to need something from from, from calc 1. Now from calc 1, if this is x and y, and let's say this is the tangent line. Suppose I want to, suppose I want to grab a tangent vector. We actually did this real early on in our course. I'd have forgotten, but that's okay. So if, if that little blue vector is along the tangent line, I could find it very easily by taking a run of one and a rise of how much? Well, the rise is going to be y prime. What's the slope of the tangent line? It's y prime over one. Slope equals y prime over one, which is y prime. No kidding. I'm going to use that idea right here green vector. I want the green vector. I'm going to move in the x direction one unit. Then I'm going to move in the z direction to get, get back to the, to the green vector. I'm not moving in the y direction. Okay, I'm moving in the x direction now to get that, that little green vector or big green vector, whatever. So that green vector that green vector, let me use green for it uh, to designate it. That green vector we're going to call V1. V1. That little green vector has an X component of 1, a Y component of 0, it doesn't move in the Y direction, and a Z, comp a Z component of partial Z partial x, the slope of that line and the slope in the x direction. So partial f, partial x at the point x naught, y naught. So I need v2. v2, to get v2, I'm going to do pretty much the same thing. I'm going to move uh, one unit in the y direction one unit in the y direction, then I'm going to turn and go directly down perpendicular to get back to the line. So now let's name the coordinates of that vector. We name the coordinates of the vector v2. Well, there's no x component. Doesn't there's no there's no x component. The y component is one. I forced that out. I wanted it to be one. 
To get back to the curve, I have to move the partial derivative with respect to y at x not y not. What's the slope of that line? It's partial f partial y, or partial with respect to y, over 1. Okay, so I'm going to choose for my normal after I get rid of this stuff here. All right, let me choose a bigger, fatter eraser to get rid of stuff. I'm going to get rid of my calc 1 reference. You can always go back and copy it if you need it. So, oh, the red vector, and I could choose as v1 cross v2 or v2 cross v1. Let's say v1, oops. Uh, stick to colors, I guess. It is v1, let's see, v1 cross the blue v2. I get for trying to be fancy v2. Okay, so let's cross those vectors. I'll just do it in black. So, v1, uh, sorry, i, j, k, 1, 0, f sub x. I'm leaving out the x not y not for the cross product. We'll put them in later. 0, 1, f sub y. So what is that cross product? Cover up the first column. Determinant of the rest. 0 times fy minus 1 times fx. Then cross the, cover up the second column. 1 times fy minus 0 times fx. But we insert a minus. Cover up the third column. The determinant of 1, 0, 0, 1. That gives us 1. OK. I could take that vector or I could take the opposite of that vector. How come I can take the opposite? Because the opposite, if the, if that vector points up, the is upward, so to speak, in the positive z direction or whatever, then the then the opposite would point in the negative direction. I don't it doesn't matter which normal vector I, I choose. There's two possible ones: the, the the red one that points up or the opposite of the red one. I'm going to take the opposite of that so that I can keep f, f sub x and f sub y positive. Now here's the deal. That's that's a normal vector. So the normal vector is f sub x at x naught y naught f sub y at x naught y naught and negative 1. Let's find the equation of the plane. The equation of the plane, the, the normal, uh, the, sorry, not normal plane, the, the tangent plane is the first component of my normal times x minus x naught plus the second component of my normal fy times x naught y naught times y minus y naught minus 1 times z minus z naught equals 0. That's the equation of the tangent plane. Now look what happens if I solve for z minus z naught. Look what happens if I solve for z minus z naught. It should look familiar. It looks kind of complicated. There's, it, it looks like it's not even an equation of a plane. It is. x naught and y naught are constants. The live variables are x, y, and z. Check this out. Compare. Compare with tangent line from calc 1. Tangent line in calc 1 went y equals f prime of a, which I can call x naught, I guess, times x minus x naught, and it was like y minus y naught. If Remember, up above I did the, the calc 1 analogy. You could also write it as y minus uh, y naught equals f prime of x naught times x minus x naught. If you want to use the notation x naught and y naught. Okay, now look at Compare the equations. This is the equation of the tangent plane. This is the equation of the tangent plane. This is the equation of the tangent line.
they look very similar they look very similar look at the the first two terms z minus z naught equals slope times x minus x naught or z minus z naught equals slope times y minus y naught okay y minus y naught equals slope times x minus x naught so there's a, a definite similarity a, a, a distinct similarity between calc, uh, calc 1 tangent line and the calc 3 tangent plane okay so I'm going to do one example. A real, I'll try to make it a real quick example of finding the equation of a tangent plane. There's not much I want you to do from this section. Okay, so let's let's do one example to finish things off. I could have paused it while I went and looked for the example. I just realized I just kept you guys sitting there. <laughs> Sorry about that. I am, and be real honest with you, I'm just yanking this. It's, it's so simple. I'm just yanking it right out of your textbook here. I don't usually like to do that, but I just, I find this, I find this section very, very simple, and I want to, I want to end things up real quick here. So find, find the tangent plane, find the tangent plane. Plane, let's say to the paraboloid c equals 2x squared plus y squared at the point uh, 1, 1, 3. Okay, so that 1, 1, 3, that's x naught, y naught, z naught. Okay. So our tangent plane requires a partial with respect to x or x. What's the partial with respect to y? 2y. So the, the tangent plane is z minus z naught equals f sub x, partial with respect to x, x naught, y naught, x minus x naught plus the derivative with respect to y, partial with respect to y, of at x naught y naught, times y minus y naught, oops. So it's z minus three equals the partial derivative, the partial derivative with respect to x at one, one times x minus one, plus the partial derivative with respect to y at one, 1 times y minus 1. Partial z partial x is 4x times x minus 1. Partial with respect to y of z is 2y, so 2 times 1 times y minus 1. And that finishes it off. This is this is simply uh, z uh, minus 3 equals 4x minus 4 plus 2y minus 2 or z equals 4x plus 2y negative 4 take away 2 is negative 6 plus 3 is minus 3 okay Super simple stuff once you get the last section. Okay, that takes us to the end of our, our video segment covering the two sections, 14.3 and 14.4. In 14.4, there shouldn't be much homework, um, but I do recommend that you dig into section 14.3 as soon as possible. It, the materials from these, this section, 4.20.3, are absolutely required in the, in the lecture for the next video segment. So try to get as, many of the, as much of the homework done as possible before uh, maybe a couple of days, okay? And I'm looking to talk, uh, forward to talking with you all again very soon.